Welcome, everybody, to the Tennis Worthy Podcast brought to you by the International Tennis Hall of Fame. I'm Brett Haber, and in the first half of 2023, the Hall of Fame published 12 long-form audio interviews with some of the great names in tennis. Season two returns in early 2024, so to whet your appetite, we've taken some of the most fascinating contributions from our first 12 interviews and put them together in five themes. Today's theme is motivation and determination. And among the players explaining what motivated them to dig deep and find something in their determination that made the difference between winning and losing, we have Leighton Hewitt, Tracy Austin, Mats Wielander, Stan Smith, David Hall, and Mark Woodford. Chris Bowers, who hosted all 12 of the interviews for the Tennis Worthy podcast, presents this review of the great names talking about motivation and determination. Take it away, Chris. Determination, desire, motivation, that will to keep going and not give up. We have lots of words for it, but everyone's story is different. When we think of the junior career of those who went on to become champions, what was it that separated them from other youngsters who could probably hit the same forehands and backhands, yet ended up losing to the people we know who went on to become the greats of tennis? The people you're going to hear from in this podcast generally talk about their childhood, and let's start with the 17 times Grand Slam doubles champion Mark Woodford, who, with Todd Woodbridge, made up the Woodies. When he was a kid in Adelaide, looking to make his mark among some very gifted rivals, what marked Woodford out compared with others? I think belief, never say die attitude. I don't think I'm an outwardly confident person, but I think I reassured myself um, I had a passion for this sport and. I felt like if I put the work in, there was going to be rewards. And, and I felt like looking back, I put my head down and, and went about it. And I think if you ask Todd, I might have got my butt kicked on a particular day and the score might have been 6-1, 6-1. And yeah, you know, pretty heavy loss. But I would look at it, um, I, I lost, I got well and truly beaten. But there were two games that I did something right. And I wanted to build upon those two games. And I got back out there the next day and Todd said, you know, it would take me a day or two days to recover. And he said, you were back out there the next day and like you've never had that loss in that week. I, I just went about my, my routine in that manner. Um, did you always have that belief or was tennis the activity where you discovered that's actually where I really do believe. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't very uh, studious. You know, I got by, you know, with my education. Um, back in our mid-teens, there was Darren Cahill, uh, Todd Viney, Peter Carter, Anthony Lane, and myself. So we were all from Adelaide, and we all were in the, the state squad and trained together. And then the evolution of the Australian Institute of Sport came around. We all had aspired. I said, this is great. We, we, we you know, can apply. Hopefully we'll be selected and move to Canberra and you live most of the year there and get all of this fantastic training that is going to be um, provided. I wasn't selected. I was actually, at that time, I think I was probably one or two in my age group, but these other guys got selected. It, it bothered me for sure, but it didn't deter me. It, it, uh, Did it spur you on? I'm, I'm sure it, it, it must have. Um, my dad did turn around and, and say, yeah, prove them wrong, you know, prove them that, that it was a mistake. And, you know, it doesn't mean to say that you can't keep going, young fella. So I, I you know, basically just stayed back in Adelaide and my, really, my outlook was, you know, I'll prove them wrong. Even to the sense of when I eventually travelled overseas with Barry Phillips Moore. Would you have had the desire to prove them wrong if there hadn't been people around you, in particular your dad, who would have said, come on, fella, you can still make it. Because that could have been a, it could have ended the hopes of some youngsters. Uh, absolutely. I would see my mates from the Institute of Sport traveling in Europe that first, second year. I've been away for eight, nine months because once you go away, when you're privately funded, you go away once for the year. My parents didn't have enough money to, you know, for me to go back and forth. So I, you know, was like homesick. And when I saw these Institute of Sport guys, they're coming in for six weeks to play in Europe and they were going home. 
my heart would sink just that knowledge that they could come away for a short period of time and go home. Then that you'd hear about them going over to the US for seven weeks and they'd go home. They went to Asia for four weeks and then went home. And But Barry kept saying, that's not necessarily the pathway to success. You get spoiled by going home consistently. You all are being exposed to different cultures almost on a weekly basis. Um, you're going to build strength. And from strength, you know, comes belief and away we go. So I followed that example and I just wanted to show these other guys when I got home to Australia how much stronger, not just physically, but probably more mentally, that I had become by spending a long time overseas in my first few years. So I always had this measuring stick from the guys that were in the nationally funded program. And again, go back to, I, I guess I wanted to prove them wrong. The guy who made those selections for the Institute of Sport ended up being the Woody's coach, Ray Ruffles. So we, we laugh about it now. You know, he said, yeah, I, just, I didn't think you were worth a cracker. He said, I didn't think you were gonna pursue tennis. Big of, big of him for admitting that. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's, that's why I've always got along well with Ruff. But he, he said, you know, it's not, it's not always the case where you, they select people in these programs because it is, is a catalyst for some of them to, I'm going to prove them wrong. There's not always just this, well, not only one path to success, there are these multiple pathways. And so I was just on a different highway compared to some of the other guys, my, my teammates. Mark Woodford talking about how rejection fueled his determination. For Mats Villander, the seven times Grand Slam singles champion from Sweden, it was a different kind of determination. He didn't grow up with a tennis centre just round the corner from where he lived. He needed a lift in the car from his parents. And an incident at a coaching clinic he gave not so long ago prompted him to realise how much that limited form of transportation played a part in his ultimate success. I was doing clinics for kids in, in Vecture, in my hometown, and the coach for these kids, and they were like anything from 7 to 10, the coach was a year older than me. He was my best friend in my original tennis club. We played doubles together all the time, and we were the same level when we were very young, when we were 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. He was a year older, so we were always the same level, and one of the kids said to him, so he said, so coach, how come... You didn't win all these tournaments, but Mats did. We looked at each other and like, that's the question that we need to find the answer to. Because it has nothing to do with strokes to a certain degree. And I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. I think one of the answers is that I had to not fight physically, but I had to fight to get to the tennis courts, as in I needed a ride from my mom or dad because, because we lived uh, 20 minutes outside by car. So I had to get a ride, and often I got a ride with my mom or dad when they took my two older brothers, dropped them off at hockey, which was about a 15-minute drive, and then there's another 15 to the tennis courts, and then the person, mom or dad, in general, dad, would wait for me to practice my 45 minutes, which is all we got in, in, on indoors because we only had one court, and we were 400 members, and we must have been 50 kids that were within two or three years of me. And I think that I had to adjust. So I think the, the answer is, I think I was forced to adjust to playing on black asphalt in the summer in a parking lot at my father's and my mom's factory, then going to play on clay courts sometimes, and then having to adjust to playing uh, in uh, school gyms where you play on wood, and then you have to adjust to going to the tennis club and you play indoors on Baltex. Indoors on what? On Boltex. Boltex is a carpet surface that's which what the Germans played on in Davis Cup. Right, it's so like lightning fast. In, yeah, indoor carpet that's lightning fast. It, it wasn't for us when you're a little kid. You actually think it's pretty slow compared to the wood that you would play on in the gym. But I think that the only difference in, in us was that the kids that grew up next to the tennis club, they could take their bike. Some of them walked. So it was kind of all up to them, so they can go whenever they wanted. Whereas for me, I couldn't take my bike because it was too far. So I needed to have someone take me there. So does that mean that they were pushing me? No, but they gave me the opportunity to go and practice three times a week, 45 minutes a time. But they wouldn't have 
And I think this is where I liken it to what Nadal has done, which is I always thought when Tony was around, there was one main objective in Rafa's eyes, and that was to play his absolute heart out at all times on every single point. And I think at least it seemed like it to me that he wanted, he wanted his uncle to, okay, you passed today. You gave it everything, and that was the bottom line. Now, if you win or lose, that's irrelevant. So I think that what happened to me, I most probably took more responsibility while I was on court because I knew that I couldn't, can't do anything without my mom and dad. So I think that my values were different compared to the guys that can choose. You know what? I'm not going to go today or whatever. For me, it was... There was no chance. I'm going. Was it like an obligation? That's what I mean. The, I think the obligation was not to go. The obligation was if I went, which I did every single time, to run to pick up balls, make as few mistakes as possible because I'm here. What am I going to do? So I think that and that's just stuck with me because I have a, a pretty amazing ability to focus on hitting tennis balls when I'm on the court. Still, I can literally focus on every single shot. So I think that focus comes from having decided early, and this is not even me deciding, it's just being put in a situation where I think I felt obligated to try as hard as you can all the time. And I think that other kids don't have that luxury because they had the, it was kind of their choice to get to the tennis. It was always my choice to play. Mats Villander explaining how benefiting from a parent's lift to a 45-minute lesson gave him an obligation to focus, which helped him at the highest level of the sport. Not every child would feel that obligation, but then not every child becomes a Hall of Famer. Let's move to a different form of motivation. The two times US Open champion Tracy Austin never lacked the will to practice, and with her mother working at a local tennis club, she had the facilities too. But just as she turned 14, something happened in her squad, which sharpened up her determination. There was a certain player that our coach, and I'm not going to go into names, but seemed to favour and he would give, I would assume, free lessons to her. And so my other friends that were in the same situation where, you know, we were middle class, we couldn't afford all sorts of lessons for me and the other four siblings. So I was, until I was about 14, I was getting a half an hour of tennis lessons a week, which is a very small, very minimal. And this other player would be getting two hours a day or an hour a day. And that would drive us, I think, to work harder. And, you know, we're going to show we're going to show him that we, you know, we don't need as much or, or we can do this. You know, think about it. Put yourself in that same situation. You're all in the same boat. But this one player gets that extra attention that will light the fire in your belly. Right. I mean, and there's more detail. The more detail is I played that player one time. I'd never beaten her. And he actually gave her advice before the match and when we split sets in between the sets. Now, I was going to pull a Boris Becker and die for every ball. I was going to win that match no matter what, and I did. And that was right before I won Portland. So it was the, the kind of the spark, the impetus, where things really started to go in an upward trajectory. The point to that story is it's sometimes you have no idea what it is that you know, that extra drive, that extra push that I possibly needed during those those few months, those couple of years. Is it possible it was deliberate that that coach wanted to get you angry? <laughs> I don't think so. But, uh, you know, whatever it is, I, looking back at the time, I was furious that somebody else was getting so much, uh, you know, free time on the court. But now I'm very thankful. Whatever makes you angry, eh? Tracy Austin there on how a lack of fairness intensified her desire to win. Desire is a big factor in the career of David Hall, the remarkable Australian who lost his legs in a car crash when he was 16, but went on to become a Hall of Famer thanks to 24 Grand Slam wheelchair singles titles and six Paralympic medals. So what separated Hall from his rivals on the wheelchair tour? For me, it was uh, desire. I think that was the main driver. I think... You know, a lot of times players have similar serves, forehands, backhands. Uh, their strength is quite similar. I think uh, the, the difference can be the mental, emotional part of it. And so 
I think for me, just we can boil it down to matches or you can boil it down to, to winning uh, more and more. That, that you just want it so badly that it just ends up being a Hall of Fame career. I think for me, if I look back on it, it was desire was the main driver for me. And I think that in a lot of ways uh, separated me from the other top players. And I think it was just something that if I won, say, one Australian Open or one US Open, then that wasn't enough. Like I wanted more. I wanted two US Opens. I wanted three Australian Opens. I wanted six British Opens. It, it just kind of, I guess you could say it's like a, a snowball just rolling down the mountain. It just gains momentum. And then before you know it, uh, 10 years later, you've got, you know, seven US Opens. And, and I, I think that was just that, you know, I was so committed over such a long period of time that, yeah, I think, I think desire was the main thing for me. There's obviously a massive turning point in your childhood at 16 when you were hit by the car. Before 16, did you have that drive? Did you always have that as a child or do you think it came after as a result of not wanting to be got down by what happened to you? I think I did have the drive. I don't think it was at that level after I started wheelchair tennis. I think as a kid, like I ran track and field, I played soccer, uh, played tennis. I was sporty and I was pretty talented as a kid, but I just I was never going to be good enough to play any of those sports professionally. But I think the fact that I, I can't remember giving up like in a race as a kid, you know, I can't remember giving up uh, in a match like as a junior. And so I think after the accident, obviously things change. You know, you have to try to transition back into society. And I think that is the biggest struggle of all. Uh, even though something devastating had happened to me physically, like losing both legs, the bigger aspect of that was trying to transition back into the real world. And I think that comes from, I don't know, an emotional part of it. Uh, obviously, there were times where you think I'm not going to be able to do this. And I remember that there was a guy when I was still in the hospital and it wasn't long after the second amputation. Uh, there was a nurse in there that was just fantastic. And she came into my hospital room and she said, David, I want you to talk to this guy that I know, Alan. And Alan had lost his legs. He'd been run over by a train and miraculously survived. And Alan wheels his chair into the room. And it was funny because straight away, I thought he was going to give me some, some uh, words of wisdom. But he hands me a cassette tape of ACDC's Back in Black. And he says, mate, you are going to hit anger at some point. You're going to feel that emotion. And at the time, I was a, a fan of Duran Duran. So, so I, was, I felt like I had no use for this ACDC. But Alan was totally right. Because at some point, I did hit anger. Like when I got back into the real world. And like listening to that kind of music, it was almost like a soothing thing, like in a weird way. But then uh, later on in the conversation, he leaned in and he said, you know, I'm going to give you this piece of advice. And he said, the only person that can really help you is you. And at the time, I just like I didn't really know what he meant by that, because I was thinking, yes, the doctors could help the nurses, the physios, my family. But ultimately, if I was going to make this transition uh, back into society that I had to be the one to do it. Like I had to be the one to get to whatever was next. And it just happened to be that tennis was next. I didn't know it at the time, but I think from that perspective, it was, it was a great piece of advice. And a great piece of advice for all walks of life. David Hall talking about how he got through the loss of his legs and what drove him to be a wheelchair tennis legend. Listening to these champions, it's easy to believe that their inner confidence was always there. But you can't take that for granted. 
The 1971 US Open and 72 Wimbledon champion Stan Smith, today known among youngsters more for the shoe to which he gave his name rather than his tennis exploits, was a highly competent Californian. But it took two of the legends of the game to compliment Smith before he really believed he could be a world beater. It wasn't until I was a senior in high school, senior in college that I uh, I did get to play at Wimbledon for those years in the summertime. Uh, after my freshman year in college and then sophomore, junior, senior. But it wasn't until, you know, 68 or 9 that I beat a couple of good players that I thought maybe I could become a good player. But it really was 1971 I won the Masters that uh, I really felt I belonged. And that the interesting thing that happened to me was I was playing at Wembley, and it was Wembley, then Stockholm, and then the Masters, and at Wembley, I had Pancho Gonzalez match point and lost. And uh, Jack Kramer came up to me and said, you know, kid, you're playing playing really well. Just keep at it. You're going to win some matches like that. And, you know, you're playing at a, at a really high level. And so I won the doubles at Wembley and then won singles and doubles at Stockholm and then won the singles and doubles uh, at the end of the year. So that comment that he made to me encouraged me at a time when I was a little bit upset and, and discouraged. It led me to believe that I could beat the top guys. And the other th comment that really helped me was that I heard from Rosewall a, uh, a quote from Rosewall at the Masters that they asked him who, who were the favorites of the tournament. And he had mentioned me as, as one of the couple favorites in the tournament. And when I heard that from one of my peers, I realized, well, maybe I am, you know, at the same level as these guys. And so I ended up playing him in the finals, actually, the last round of the round robin and and uh, won that match to win the, the Masters. So did Kramer's comments and Rosewall's comments, were they almost part like a missing piece of the jigsaw in your own confidence? Yes. I mean, those two comments really helped me to realize that I was able to compete with the very top guys and, and, and even they thought I was at that level. So that really enabled me to, to go out there playing with a, with trying to win and not just trying to have a good score against uh, these good players. Stan Smith. And it's amazing to think that a kindly word by a couple of greats can make so much difference. We don't think of Leighton Hewitt, the Aussie who also won the US Open in Wimbledon, as someone who lacks confidence, but his inner strength came from somewhere else. His dad played Australian rules football, where the uncompromising team ethic inherent in most locker rooms creates a frightening sense of purpose. So did Hewitt's tennis profit from what he picked up from Aussie rules footy? Absolutely. I guess AFL football scene in a lot of ways is you don't show anything, you know, you, you don't show anyone if you're injured, you don't show anyone if you're hurt. And it doesn't matter how much pain you're going through, you're going to keep fighting and find a way. And a lot of that, you do that because you've got teammates on the sideline that you don't want to let down, obviously. Um, in tennis, it's not like that. But I, I think 100% that's where it, a lot of things came from for me. But also my love for Davis Cup and playing in any kind of team aspect 100% came from not being able to play AFL football. That was probably the one thing that I, I missed the most about playing tennis. It's great that you're in control of your own destiny on a tennis court and there's nowhere to hide because it's just a one-on-one -on -one battle and no one can help you once you're out there. But it's also... I love doing it for your mates and your captain and coach on the sideline. Um, and I think, you know, when you do have success, it means a lot more when you can celebrate with those people. Was there a point where you were aware in a tennis context that you had a lot stronger competitive instinct than many of the other kids around you? I, uh, I'm not sure. I think in juniors, I, you know, even the under-14s when I went over to Europe, it was my second trip to Europe. The first year I went, and I was a year out of my age group. The second year I went and won three out of the four tournaments over there and played on clay, European clay, um, which we never play on in Australia. We grew up on hard courts. So in terms of that and just my competitiveness and um, passion and, and leaving it all on the court, I, I still remember times in that junior tour where I did that and I felt like I did it better than a lot of the other kids at that age group. And that's something that sort of continued on. And 
it's probably one of the main reasons why I was able to have that self-belief and drive to be able to make the transition from juniors to seniors very quickly as well at the age of 15 or 16 uh, and have success against older, bigger guys and basically men when I was still just a kid at the time. Did you ever develop a mindset of it's them against me, it's them against us, the way Jimmy Connors was encouraged to believe that they're out to get you, Jimmy? Um, yeah, certainly at times I did. Probably used that more in uh, that mindset in Davis Cup, to be honest, and, and probably in a way ties um, when you're playing and you've got people screaming against you and, and you really just have to focus on your player bench and your captain and coach on the side of the court. You know, it, it was sort of our backs against the wall kind of mentality, which is something I, I liked. Um, but also, you know, I was a big fan of the Rocky movies growing up as well. And so there were certain times when, you know, I would, I'd twist it in my mind that, you know, that was the situation I'd been put in. And, and I enjoyed that. Um, and, and some of my greatest victories in Davis Cup were those away ties when, you know, the chips are down and, and you've got to find a way to somehow pull through. And, and that's about bonding together with your teammates as well. Ah, there's a lot to learn from the team variants of tennis. Leighton Hewitt there talking about playing mind games with the Rocky movies. And given that he wasn't the tallest player on the circuit, Hewitt is a classic example of how motivation and determination, when carefully channelled, can take you right to the top in tennis. You've been listening to just a few of the fascinating moments from the first season of the Tennis Worthy podcast brought to you by the International Tennis Hall of Fame. There will be more excerpts presented by Chris Bowers next time when the theme will be learning, improving, and psychology. And among the legends you'll be hearing from will be Yvonne Lendl, Gigi Fernandez, Pam Shriver, and John Newcomb. And remember, you can hear the full interviews by going to tennisfame.com slash podcast. Do have a listen to season one. It is well worth it. I'm Brett Haber. Thanks so much for listening to the Tennis Worthy Podcast.